I heard this old story of a young woman who had been brought up in a Christian home and was told often to come to saving faith in Jesus. But she chose instead to live the ways of the world. And much against the wishes of her very godly mother, this lady insisted on keeping company with the wrong crowd who lived only for the world and for the passing moment and didn't care about the things of eternity. Again and again, she was evangelized too by loved ones, but she refused to listen to the exhortations given to her. So finally, she got very ill. And I'm talking about ill to the point of death. There was not much that doctors could do for her at the time, since it was kind of back in the old days, and death was staring her right in the face. Yet even in this moment, she was still stubborn when urged to turn to God in repentance so that her soul can be saved. So one night, this lady awoke suddenly from a sleep and she looked very frightened and asked her mother, Mother, what is Ezekiel chapter 7 verses 8 to 9? Her mother said, What do you mean, my dear? And the girl said that she had the most vivid dream. She said in that dream, she felt a presence in the room who solemnly said to her, Read Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 8 to 9. The mother didn't have the full Bible memorized, and she didn't really know what this verse said. So she reached for a Bible, she opened it, and it was said that her heart sunk as she saw the words in those two verses. And she read them aloud to the dying girl. Now, in case you guys don't know what that passage says, I'll read it to you. It says, Now... I will shortly pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you, judging you according to your ways and bring on you all your abominations. My eye will show no pity, nor will I spare. I will repay you according to your ways while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I, the Lord, do the smiting. And when the sick girl heard this, she had a look of terror on her face. And in a few moments, she collapsed and she was in eternity. And this is one very sad example of how grace rejected finally brings about judgment for this one poor soul. And sadly, this is only one of many stories we hear of people who grew up in a Christian household, beginning all the way from the days of Jesus, even to right now, who heard the gospel many times. Maybe they've been through Sunday school, they've been to church services, they've served in church, but they never really actually believed in Christ. Instead, they chose to live for sin and for themselves and for their idols. And this isn't just an example of opportunity that was wasted. But it shows how the patience of God was really on display even all those years that this lady heard the gospel and she rejected it and God gave her chance after chance after chance until finally enough was enough and justice came. Very sad, huh? And we do see that very vividly described in today's parable which speaks about God's patience with the nation of Israel. We know Israel heard God's word for so long. They had the law of God. They heard it again and again and again. In fact, God even sent his son, Jesus Christ, to tell them the ultimate revelation, which is the gospel, so that they could be saved, so that they can pretty much see the kingdom coming to life at that moment. But instead, they rejected it. Yeah, we know God is patient, but eventually he does bring judgment, especially on religious hypocrites. And that's the theme of today's message we're going to be looking at in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 18. So last week, if you guys remember, Jesus enters into the temple and he cleanses it because he saw all of this wicked stuff happening in the 
in you know in the this marketplace that was happening and he was overturning tables and he was driving out the money changers because of all these people's greed and hypocrisy he would have none of it so this week jesus is going to continue to teach about the corruption of not just the system but of the religious leaders in general by telling this parable called the parable of the vine growers which shows us about God's judgment that is coming upon religious hypocrites. That's really the main point of today's passage. So let's look at it together. So the main idea, God teaches us two sobering points in this parable to describe the inevitable judgment of religious hypocrites. So let's look at point number one. So the parable begins with the actions of the wicked vine growers. We see that in verses 9 to 15. So he's going to show us their actions. What did they do? What does it tell us about them? So let's begin by looking at verse 9 so we can see this parable opening. In verse 9 it says, And he, Jesus, began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. Have you guys seen a vineyard before? It's pretty pretty, right? I like vineyards. You go to the north, you see them all the time. And they were very common in Israel back then along the hillsides. So the parable begins with this man who plants a vineyard and according to the Gospel of Matthew, he also puts a wall around it and a wine press in it along with a tower to guard it against robbers and animals. And then he also rents it out to these vine growers. And these were farmers who rented the land and the only catch is they had to give a percentage to the owner. I mean, it sounds like a very simple arrangement and it says that the owner the man went away, far away, probably for a long time. So this parable continues and says, At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Whoa, what's going on here? Well, just like it says. The master sent a slave and they beat him. Very shocking. So at harvest time, the vine growers, you know, they have to give an accounting of what they produce. They have to give some percentage to this master. But what happens next is pretty shocking. It says, when the slave goes to the vine growers to receive the payment, they beat up the slave pretty badly and they tossed him out. Why did they do this? Well, obviously, because they were greedy. They just wanted everything for themselves. They completely ignored this arrangement that they made with this man. I mean, just think of it. What if you were to rent out a space somewhere along the street or you were going to go into the mall and you wanted a little booth so you can set up a restaurant? They say, you have to pay me some rent every month. Of course, that's reasonable, right? And then you just say, no, I'm not going to pay you anything. You send the managers to me, I'm just going to beat them up and throw them out. What, what happens to you then? You probably go to jail, right? And that's exactly what this man could have done with these vine growers. He had every right to take legal action. He had every right to get them punished, but he acted patiently. And it just shows this was a very patient man. So continuing in verse 11, it says, he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treat him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. Instead of coming to their senses and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, it was just a misunderstanding. At least they could have said something like that, even though it wouldn't have been a great excuse, but they doubled down and they beat up the second slave and they sent him away too. Then what happens next? In verse 12, it says he proceeded to send a third one. Okay, giving a third chance. And this one also they wounded and 
cast out. And the Gospel of Mark and Matthew says that additional slaves are sent and the same thing happened. Wow, this is so shocking. The boldness, the corruption of these vine growers. So now this is where everything gets pretty dramatic. In verse 13, the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. Like I said, the owner had every right to punish these vine growers for their crimes, but he acted patiently and he decided to send his own son so that they can see and they can cooperate so that they know he means business. But it says, when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned one with one another saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So instead of showing respect to the owner's son, that's what you should be doing. But look at what they said. They were scheming to plot to murder the son. Woo! So, you know, according to ancient law, it was said that if the land remained unclaimed for three years, as if, if the original owner died, then it reverted to those who were caring for it. So I guess the idea was that since this master went away for a long time, they heard nothing about it. They probably assumed that he was dead. So they were probably thinking, okay, if we got rid of the sun, then this whole vineyard would be ours. Then we can take it. Wow. So according to verse 15, it says, so they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Wow, the most outrageous deed done. Okay, you kill my slave, that's one thing, but you kill my son, <laughs> that's pretty bad, right? I don't know how you would feel about that, but my patience would be wearing very thin by that point. Yeah. Okay, so maybe now you're asking, so what does this whole parable mean? Because every one of Jesus' parables have some sort of spiritual meaning, right? Because that's really what a parable is. It's a long analogy with some sort of spiritual truth regarding the issue of salvation. So it's pretty simple. I'm going to break it down for you. The vineyard here represents Israel, the nation of Israel. The vine growers are the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who represented Israel, but completely botched it because of their greed and their hypocrisy and their depravity, and the slaves are the Old Testament prophets who have come to warn Israel again and again throughout the Old Testament period. And finally, the son is who? Who do you think? Jesus, that's right. Yeah, it does, it's pretty simple, right? I bet even kids can figure this out. So pretty much what Jesus was showing was the sad history of from the Old Testament time all the way to Jesus' time and the complete failure of the religious leaders, especially during the days of Jesus. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how they were all corrupt. So the care of the entire nation of Israel was put into their hands of the religious leaders. And what did they do? They became corrupt. They became apostate, and if you don't know what that word means, that means they departed from the truth. They claimed to worship God. They claimed to believe in the Torah, the Tanakh, but they did not because they invented a new religious system to replace it. It was called legalism because they wanted to just kind of do their own thing. They wanted the nation to themselves. They wanted all the power and prestige. So basically, they wanted to take over the whole system. Whoa. See, when that happens in religion, that's where it gets pretty bad. So the slaves represent, like I said, the Old Testament prophets who came to bring God's message to the people. And we know who some of these prophets are, right? Everybody from Moses to Jeremiah to Ezekiel to Isaiah to all the minor prophets who always came with some sort of message of urgent judgment, right? That's coming. But what did Israel do? They didn't repent. In fact, in the Old Testament, we saw how some of these prophets were beaten and killed 
by the Israelites. So finally, New Testament period, we see Jesus come onto the scene, the ultimate messenger of God. Surely the people must listen to him. I mean, he's bringing signs and wonders. They should listen to this guy, right? Even this could not bring any repentance. Sure, you can heal all the people you want. You can raise up all the Lazaruses you want. I'm still not going to repent. That's what happened with them. That's pretty scary. So they plotted to kill the son. You see, this is already a preview of the cross right here. And it happened at Calvary so that they could retain their power over Israel. So the whole lesson behind point number one is this. You can claim to be a worshiper of God and still be completely lost and condemned. Did you know that? Yeah, you can claim to believe in the Old and the New Testament and still not do the work of God, still not believe in the truth. And we see that in Israel's history. But the wonderful thing about this situation, I think this is really the most wonderful thing is despite all this, God is still patient. Did you know that in the Old Testament, he was so patient with the nation of Israel? That he gives these religious hypocrites time and time again to repent and get right. But what happens if they don't? God's patience wears thin. And we see that in the second and the last point. So the parable culminates with the outcome of the wicked vine growers. So now we see what happens to these vine growers who did this really bad thing. So in verse 15, the last half... Jesus asked, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? In verse 16, it says, he will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. What do you think he means by that? I think it's pretty simple, right? When Jesus says that he's going to come and bring, he's going to destroy the vine growers. It's pretty simple. He's going to pretty much destroy the religious leaders. He's going to destroy the system. And we saw that happen in the year 8070 when Rome came. They ransacked the temple. They pretty much tore down the entire religious system. Of course, they killed millions of the Jews. And then when they died, where did they go after that? It's pretty obvious, right? Everybody who dies in their sins stand before God on the day of judgment. So it's a very serious warning that he made. So basically he was saying to them, the responsibility you have, you messed it up. So now I'm going to take your responsibility and I'm going to hand it to another person. And we see how this mantle was passed from Israel to the church. Because God raised up Israel in order so that they can be his people, his holy priesthood, his evangelists. That's what he wanted Israel to be. But instead, they just remained in unbelief. So now we have the church who's doing the duty, establishing you know, God's word, preaching the gospel everywhere, making disciples, showing us how to worship God. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about. So then he ends it off right here in verse 17. But before that, what's interesting in verse 16, when Jesus said all this, the people heard it and they said, may it never be. So basically they were saying, oh no. So they understood God's judgment is coming. But Jesus said to them, he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief corner stone. I don't know if you guys heard of that term before, cornerstone or chief cornerstone. Yeah, there are songs in the church that are written about it too. I mean, you can kind of look up the pictures online, but cornerstone, it's like a very important piece of stone in a building. So it pretty much determines the outcome of how the entire building would look. So if you have the right cornerstone, then you're going to have the good foundation to build the rest of the building. So what Jesus was getting at here, he quoted from Psalm chapter 118. 
So he was using it as an analogy to show that Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone that the people rejected. He was the cornerstone that Israel rejected, the foundation behind God's temple that he's building, which is the church. That's what he was trying to get at. And he ends with this. This is like the last verse here that pretty much sums up this entire parable right here. He says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. What does that mean? It basically means whether you have outright rejected Christ or you are just indifferent to Christ, doesn't matter. Both cases, you're an enemy of Christ and you will fall to judgment. It's coming. I mean, it's a warning not just to the religious leaders, but it's a warning to all of us who reject Christ. Because, you know, even in the church, in the youth group and adult group, doesn't matter. There are people in there who can be just like these religious leaders in the Old Testament. They claim to worship God. They claim to have faith, but there's no fruit. They don't truly believe. And God says that judgment is eventually coming. So the whole lesson behind point number two is this. So I hope you guys don't miss this point. Jesus is very crucial to the salvation picture. Because the Jews thought that they can just come to God on their own terms without Jesus. And yes, a lot of Jewish people believe that today as well. That you can come to God anyway. As long as I believe in God, then I'm good. No, he says, if you remove Jesus out of the picture, then you can expect nothing but judgment for your sins. So all true worship of God must go through Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, then you're pretty much worshiping a false god. You're worshiping an idol. And it will only lead to judgment. So in closing, I want to encourage you with this. So Jesus tells us about the actions and the outcome of the vine growers. Not just as a warning to the Pharisees, but to us listening today. So it's pretty simple. This is a message for us to examine our own faith to see where exactly are we. Do we think we're more like the disciples? You know, those who have true faith, those whom God used to build the church, you know, especially in the book of Acts? Or are we more like these religious leaders? And you can tell. Because if you were to open the Bible, you read it, and you're very receptive to it, and you actually do it, then it's pretty obvious which camp you're in. But if you do things that are completely opposite the Bible, I don't care what you say you believe about God. You can say, yeah, me and God, we're all good, you know, this and that. You're not good with God. That's what he's trying to say right here. Because these leaders thought that they were good with God, but God says they're in for a rude awakening. So it really causes us, we need to examine our faith to make sure we are right with God and that we don't fall through the cracks. Because there are religious hypocrites even in the church and they will also come to judgment, just like Israel if they do not repent. And there's also something else I really want you to take away from this. We see here God's judgment that comes upon religious leaders, but we also see, like I said, the patience of God on display again and again. So if you're here today, you're still alive and you're hearing this, remember the only reason you're here is because God is still being patient with you. And maybe you didn't kill one of his slaves and throw him out of the vineyard, but you still have sinned against God. And God is still being patient with you and I. So while we have the time today, let's not ignore the patience of God, but rather use it as an opportunity to get right with God. Let's pray.
Lord, there are times in Scripture in which you give us these very difficult moments, these parables, these stories that shock us, that gets us to think about where do we stand before the Lord? Are we a true worshiper or are we a hypocrite? Have we believed in Christ for us? our salvation or are we believing in another version of God that has no Christ in the picture because you say again that you are the way the truth and the life that no one comes to the Father except through you because only in you do we have our righteousness only in you do we have the hope of resurrection because that's what you have come to do on the cross, to die for our sins, but to also resurrect, to give us hope of justification. So we pray, Lord, that if we have gone on the wrong path of hypocrisy, forgive us, Lord. Grant us repentance and true faith so that we can walk in obedience to experience your fullest blessings. Because in our faith, you look for fruit. Every Christian you have called to bear fruit. So let us indeed as Christians bear fruit so that we can give that back to you in worship and not be like those wicked vine growers who had no fruit nor desired to give you anything, but rather have lived in unbelief and wickedness. Let us not be like that. Let us not experience that same tragic fate, but instead to take advantage of your patience while we still have time because you are a good God and we want what is best for us as well through the gospel of Christ, our eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.